Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Charles Beardall. I'm the area manager for the Environment Agency. My, my patch covers Norfolk, Suffolk, and Essex. And I'm going to be talking about the three counties, all the figures that I'm going to use when I talk about the state of the water environment now is about Norfolk, Suffolk, and Essex. So my job really is to... Is this, is this working again? Oh, I haven't changed my name. There we go. My job is to set the scene really for the discussions this afternoon and field visits uh, tomorrow and then again the discussions after that uh, on the third day. So I'm going to hover above the three counties of Norfolk, Suffolk and Essex and take a strategic look at the way we use water, some of the challenges that we face in this very dry part of the country and then a look at some of the positive things that are happening in the future and hope that will lead into the discussions uh, this afternoon uh, from the speakers that, that follow. So first, a little bit of, a little bit of scene setting, uh, especially for those of you in the audience who are unfamiliar with this part of the country. Um, these are the, uh, the AOMBs that you'll be visiting uh, tomorrow, uh, and the Norfolk and Suffolk Broads area. But I also put in on the blue patches just really to emphasise the importance of this part of the country for wetlands and water. As far as the natural environment is concerned, the, the sites that are designated under the European Habitats Directive for Birds Directive. Those are the blue areas, so you can see there's a splattering of sites inland in the green. Those are valley fens and other fenland systems, and the Norfolk Broads itself with the fens around there. But also the coast, uh, the, uh, the salt marshes and estuaries of the Suffolk coast and the Essex coast. So I think you can see apart from one little stretch in northeast Norfolk, we are virtually wall-to-wall -wall European designated sites. But water is the core element of all these sites sustaining huge areas of freshwater grazing marshes, some of the largest reed beds that we have in the country, some of the most important valley fens that we have in Europe, brackish lagoons, open lakes and the broads and uh, rivers itself. Our AOMBs uh, and the Norfolk Broads, as has been discussed already, are a huge attraction for tourists. Water is at the core element of, of the attraction for tourists to come to this part of the country and provide a very vibrant economy in these particular areas. We have some of the most visited reserves in the whole of the UK. Titchwell on the North Norfolk coast and Minsmere on Suffolk, for instance, are, are the two most visited RSPB reserves in the UK. But of course, water and the competition for water, and I'll talk about that uh, as we move through my uh, presentation, uh, is hugely important for sustaining agriculture, industry and public water supply in this part of the country. And water supplies are significantly challenged here in East Anglia with a combination of climate change, growth, increasing demand for agriculture, and the need to protect the natural environment and the living landscapes that we have in the AONBs. So, moving on to the basics then to start with and leading us through to look at some of the challenges. How much water have we got? What are we playing with in this part of the world? We are the driest part of the country. This is just the rainfall map that uh, is uh, looking at East Anglia. Uh, but certain parts of uh, I should put the next bit on. Certain parts of uh, the Suffolk coast and the Essex coast are the driest parts of the country, the very driest parts of the country. We have 34% uh, less than the national average in our three counties. Jerusalem is there at the bottom. The minister mentioned uh, North Africa and the climate there. Well, parts of the Suffolk coast and the Essex coast are far drier than uh, Jerusalem. So we don't really have much water to play with at all as far as uh, what's coming from the sky. Our climate is effectively semi-arid. Every summer, more water evaporates off the land and through plants and falls on the land. So we have a drought effectively every summer, exacerbated when the rainfall is even, even less. So a very dry part of the country where our water is also where our water resources are, are very limited. We are blessed, however, with one asset that makes it a very habitable part of the country, and that is the groundwater aquifers where water is stored. And we have three main aquifers, chalk, which is the green bit there, which is close to the surface in, in the west, but dips underneath the yellow uh, and the brown as it moves uh, towards the sea, which is a major aquifer for us. Local importance is the Red Crag in Norfolk and Suffolk, which is on the, uh, the east coast there, as you can see. Uh, and then as we move forward into Essex, much of the chalk has this London clay capping it, 
which means that it's really only the sands and gravels and the river terraces that supply the, supply the aquifers there. So the aquifers act like a rechargeable battery every winter when it rains more, the water percolates into the groundwater rocks. In the summer when there's virtually no rain or not so much rain, then the aquifers spill their water out into the rivers, feeding the rivers and providing the base flow for many of our rivers. Our rivers in Norfolk, because the chalks where it is there, have a strong base flow. The Wensum, for instance, has a very strong base flow. Uh, whereas when you move down into Essex, there's very little supply of water from the groundwater into the rivers, so those rivers are very flashy, they're very rain dependent. Interestingly, a lot of our rivers, the flow in the summer is heavily augmented by effluent from sewage treatment works. If you, uh, if you look in, in Suffolk, for instance, where there is a strong base flow, I mentioned the River Wensum, which goes out of Norwich, uh, that has about a 6% contribution from um, effluent. But as we move down into Essex, some of the rivers there, 70% of the summer flow is actually flow that's coming from the sewage treatment works. Very high quality effluent. But I think it's important to know that the really important source of water that sustains our rivers uh, is coming from the cycle of water as it passes through the sewage treatment works. We have, a, we have a huge history of intervention in this part of the world because it's so dry, because it's been inhabited for thousands and thousands of years. One of the major interventions at the moment is the Ely Used to Essex Water Transfer Scheme, which transfers about 30% of Essex's water just before it goes into the wash, we abstract it, we pump it down into the rivers in Essex, and then it goes into four huge uh, public water supply reservoirs in Essex, because it doesn't have these strong uh, aquifers to provide that source of public water as the other two counties do. So a quick look at uh, who's using the water. This pie chart uh, just shows you the distribution of the water. This is volume, actually, not number of licences. So public water supply 62%, agriculture 11 industry power generation 23 It's a bit misleading because there's some really big abstractions in there that are due to hydro because all of a river has to go through a hydro, even if it's a small hydro, and so that's disproportionate really to the amount of water that's used. The hydro obviously takes water from a river and puts it back in, has virtually no impact. Public water supply takes it from a river or groundwater, but does put it back in the river, and I've explained how important that is for our water environment to put it back in. But agriculture, which is only 11% here, does actually have a disproportionate impact on the, the water environment, because it is virtually 100% consumptive. It's spray irrigation. A lot of spray irrigation goes on in this part of the world. We'll talk a bit about that later. But because it's sprayed into the air, taken out of the groundwater, sprayed into the air, goes through the plant, a lot of that, but virtually all of it evaporates back into the air and doesn't go into the land-based water cycle through our rivers or uh, through our wetlands. So spray irrigation in the summer can be as much as public water supply. I'll talk a bit about the challenges in the future when we look at uh, climate change. So what's the water availability? which is obviously really critical to uh, making sure we have some sustainable management of the water cycle in this part of the country. We have, we have a core duty in the Environment Agency to conserve, manage and secure proper use of water resources and we do this through a licensing system that I'm sure most of you will be familiar with, issuing licenses to people who require water, public water supply, agriculture and industry, but making sure and issuing that license that it doesn't damage uh, natural environment. There's enough left there to sustain the natural environment. We issue in this part of the country uh, 4,500 licenses. That's about 10% of all the licenses uh, in the country. And this diagram shows the results of what we call our catchment abstraction management strategies. Uh, I think you can see the red uh, in the summer on the left uh, and the lesser red Right. The red is where there's no more water available. We are not issuing any more licenses in those red patches uh, of our patch. Unless it's for high flows in the summer or the winter for storage. So there is virtually no supply left unless it's taken and stored uh, from high flows. So the broad picture, no more available unless we can take it out and store it. And in fact, the picture is slightly worse than this because of history and the way licenses were issued many years ago, many of our catchments are over-licensed and some of them are even over-abstracted. In fact, 60% of the, the catchments on, on this diagram here are over-licensed, but 40% of them are over-abstracted. So we not only have the problem of 
there's no more water available. To get sustainable management that doesn't damage our environment, we need to claw back some of that to get into a starting position. So it's quite some challenge there. In fact, the amount of water that is uh, over licensed there is enough to fill all the storage reservoirs in Essex, which give enough water for a million people in Essex. So it's quite a task ahead of us to make sure that we get into the starting position that we need to, to sustainably manage our water resources. I'll talk a bit about the options available. It's not all doom and gloom. There are things we can do. Tim was talking about a better approach to it just a few minutes ago to make sure we value the water better and we're all part of making sure we use it better. Moving away from water resources and looking at another measure of what the state of our water environment is like, I just quickly want to touch on the Water Framework Directive and the way that categorises our water environment. The Minister mentioned, uh, mentioned it earlier and the sort of picture that that describes is, is a bit less than rosy, even though I think the state of our natural environment is a lot better than this diagram illustrates. It's a bit fussy, so I'll describe it to you. The Water Framework Directive is looking at the ecological status of our water bodies, our rivers, our wetlands, etc. Trying to put them into good ecological status, 100% of them by 2027. The map on the right, uh, I've just put in those uh, water bodies that are moderate or poor. Poor or bad, sorry. So those are the ones uh, that cover virtually the whole area. Uh, and they are 21% in poor condition. And does that say 3%? 3% that are in bad. You can probably read them better than me. So only 9% of our water bodies are in good uh, ecological status. So we've got a huge task there to make sure that we bring our water bodies into better condition. The reasons for failure, uh, I'm sorry if you can't read this, I'll just describe two bits of the bar chart down, down at the bottom. There's two main reasons in this part of the world why our water bodies fail. One is, is phosphorus, the nutrient that's in, in the water. Phosphorus is mostly comes from sewage effluent or from agriculture. The recent modelling that we've just done shows actually that 63% of the phosphorus in our, in our area here comes from sewage treatment works and 15 from agriculture. But also the main reason for failure is of course uh, morphology down here. It's about river habitats. Most of our rivers have been deep and straightened in the past for drainage. And hence the river habitats have been taken out of them. And hence using the, the water framework directed categorization, they, they fail because the habitats are, aren't there as one would expect them to be. So that's the water framework directed. And again, as you can see with water resources, quite a challenge to improve the water environment uh, in the eastern area. But of course the challenge um, uh, does get significantly worse when we look at the impact on climate change and these are all familiar bits of information that I'm sure you've, you've heard before. I think if there's one place that climate change is going to have an impact in this country, it's going to be big here in East Anglia because of the water resource situation, because we're expecting hotter, drier summers, even though we're expecting warmer, wetter winters, that's only for three months of the year, hotter, dry summers for nine months. So the summation of that as the model show at the moment is probably about 20% less water annually by uh, 2080. So water resources, a big challenge for us in the future as we move into uh, climate change scenarios. If we look at the rivers, that, that probably means that our rivers are going to vary between 20 to 80% less flow than they have in them now. So surface abstraction is going to be an issue in the future. Talk a bit about rising sea levels as well. So um, I'm just going to talk about quickly about some of the challenges about growth very quickly, about agriculture and the sea level rise and coastal erosion. Um, agriculture, we have about half of the spray irrigation licenses in the country, in, in the Anglian region, in this quarter of the country. But it's hugely valuable for agriculture. We have some, uh, on the sandy soils in particular, sandy soils that come down the Suffolk coast and around the, uh, what, I'm sorry, I'm talking about the wrong thing. Here we go. <laughs> Excuse me, I've got the wrong, uh, wrong piece of paper in front of me. Growth. Um, we have uh, a very high predicted level of growth for the future. About 100,000 houses are predicted in the next uh, 20 or so years. Increasing demand, this is going to bring on the water supplies we have, mean that a number of our supply zones will be in deficit. There's not enough water in those uh, to provide the demand that's required up to 2040. 
these zones in particular are the ones that are under pressure. And I think you will see from where I was talking about water availability and the, the two diagrams with red, yellow and uh, green on but they coincide with some of these areas as well, as, as well, where there is no water available from within catchment. There are lots of options that are available. Um, better use of water, like uh, Tim was saying, a, a, a more cooperative way of making sure we manage demand and conserving water, reusing effluent, recharging aquifers, salination perhaps, but storage reservoirs almost definitely as well. So there's lots of ways of making sure we overcome these problems but there is no more development of uh, groundwater or surface water other than high flows in these particular areas. No doubt Peter will, will touch on that um, this afternoon. Sorry, this is where I got confused. So, moving on to agriculture, I mentioned a bit about this, but I think the challenges here are, are enormous for the future for agriculture in this part of the country. Uh, it's very valuable uh, water, it's extremely valuable for uh, farming, particularly on the sandlands which cover the east coast of Suffolk and into Norfolk. We're very hungry, but very valuable crops are grown, potatoes, carrots, sugar beets, uh, etc. As I mentioned earlier, agriculture has a disproportionate impact on, uh, on the issues of water because it is 100% uh, consumptive. And the trajectory of how much irrigation water is going to be required in the future is increasing hugely. I think it's tripled since 1980 and it looks like it's going to double again by 2050. So the demand for more and more water for agriculture uh, is there. I think the challenge with, with climate change is not only less water around, but with every one degree C temperature rise, there's a 27% increase in the water demand for agriculture. So agriculture is a serious issue that we need to address now to make sure we're facing the future and retaining its value in the local economy without actually damaging the local environment. The economic value of this agriculture is spray irrigation is absolutely huge. A study that was just looking into small parts of East Suffolk identified that uh, irrigated crops are worth about 50 million pounds. If we took irrigation away, uh, it would reduce by 11 million and take 2 million out of the local economy for employment. So it's hugely important that we actually sustain uh, the viability of agriculture into the future, but it will have to adapt. High flow storage reservoirs are quite clearly going to play a critical part in the future to make sure we capture water when it is available and use it when we need it. But at the moment, only about 5% of the licences that we've issued to farmers is for irrigation purposes. So again, we're starting from a very low level there, and we need to up the game fast to make sure there's enough water for agriculture. Just quickly uh, on the coast, because uh, in our whole coast, obviously, there's a string of estuaries, salt marshes, brackish lagoons, and other water-based habitats which are going to change again very significantly as we move into the future because of sea level rise due to climate change and global warming. Um, we have finished our shoreline management plans. When I say we, that's a partnership of all the organisations involved in managing the coast of the future. Just finished the shoreline management plans which look at how the coast is going to be managed in the next 100 years and prepare us for adapting to how our coast is going to erode. All of our coast is soft sands and muds. It all erodes and has done for thousands of years. But with an increased sea level rise, that's going to uh, increase the level of erosion. So in, in a, in a, from the period, the last period that the shoreline management plans look at, in between 50 to 100 years' time, about half of the coast, the policies for half of the coast, are, are either no active intervention or manage realignment. So there is significant change planned for our coast, uh, which again will have a significant impact on the freshwater habitats that are there at the moment as they change to uh, brackish and saltwater habitats. I put these little pictures in because uh, we're doing quite a lot now, spending quite a bit of money to help us adapt for the future. The bottom picture there is the shingle ridge at Wandswick after the surge tide that we had come down the <coughs> east coast in 2007. You can see the breaches in the shingle ridge there and the brackish water that has flowed onto the National Nature Reserve and the uh, SAC site there between Wandswick and Dunwich. Uh, here we used to bulldoze that bridge every year, cost tens and tens of thousands of pounds. Now we're going to let nature take its course there, but have built uh, countercalls back to protect what's the largest rebuild uh, in the country. The middle one is Minsmere, which again is a huge value to the local economy. 
uh, it brings in about 2.3 million pounds every year. So making sure we not only protect the natural environment that brings the tourists in, but also uh, preparing for the future changes in coast. We've just finished a scheme there that will allow the weakest part of that coastal frontage to erode whilst protecting the remainder of the National Nature Reserve and then protecting the natural environment and 103 uh, employees on the reserve and around the reserve that that reserve supports. And the top one is uh, the Broad Fund Aviation Project that the Minister mentioned earlier. So, we won't talk any more about that. So, the future solutions, there's an awful lot happening at the moment uh, uh, to prepare us for the future. I talked about the Water Framework Directive. We're just consulting around the country on the second uh, take on the river basin plans. And your involvement is essential in that as people who have knowledge in the water environment in your own patch. So please get involved in that consultation. I talked about catchment abstraction management strategies that I shared a couple of diagrams from. But the issuing of licenses at the moment is all time limited on a 6 or 12 year basis. So every 6 to 12 years we have the potential to reassess water availability and issue or not licenses. So we have capacity to adjust to a changing climate as we move forward. <coughs> We also have a project to uh, restore sustainable abstraction and the government at the moment is working up policies on how we might best do that to claw back some of the water that we've over licensed uh, in the past. Uh, adapting to agriculture and storage, Paul will be talking no doubt about that later and, and Peter Simpson about public water supply but there's a lot of options there to address the future to make sure we're in a better position. And the Minister mentioned the water bill, uh, which licensing reform and making licensing a lot more flexible than it is at the moment is one of the core elements of, of that. So there's a lot going on at the bigger picture, but there's also a lot going on at the more local picture. And I'll just finish with this slide. This is about a little pilot project that's just been set up by a whole host of partners, ourselves, local authorities, IDB, NFU, farmers. Anglia Water, East Suffolk Abstractors Group, the AOB Project, Natural England. We're very good at partnerships in, in this part of the world. Uh, we have a lot that have already been set up and are joining up to make sure we have a better approach to uh, managing the environment in the future. But this one is a little specific pilot that we're setting up on the Deeboom just to see how we can get together better to make sure we manage our water resources better. So it's looking at flood risk, it's looking at water, resources, water resources, it's looking at water quality, and getting us all together on a small part of the country to look in detail about how we can get a better strategy to face the future. So what would water trading look like uh, in this patch? Where would be the most strategic place to put farm irrigation reservoirs that can supply public water supply? This is in that deficit uh, uh, that I showed earlier on the growth slide. How can we better cream off the high flows? How we can make sure that we're protecting the rural economy in the future? All these are sort of questions that this project is uh, addressing. So rather than individuals or single English interest groups looking at these particular problems, it's about collectively getting together and seeing if we can come to a more strategic partnership approach uh, uh, to face the future. So I will finish there. Thank you very much for listening. I, I hope that sort of set the scene for the talks that will happen this afternoon and your site visits tomorrow.